Excuse me, little dog. Oh. Hi, guys. Well, let me try this rant a second time. I was going full steam ahead with this rant when I looked up <coughs> and saw one of my vacation guests staring at me open-mouthed, wondering what the hell they had just walked into. So I hope they learned something. But anyway, now that I'm hot, hiding out on this cold winter night in the middle of August, this would be Tuesday night, August 20th, 2024, my 41st wedding anniversary. Oh boy, 41 years ago, what was I thinking? But anyway, so I've been a little heavy on the overshoot here the past few days. The the William Reese uh, talks and writings and talk about overshoot and uh, how you know overshoot's going to kill us all, which is what I agree. But of course, overshoot will make exactly zero difference if we have this little thing called a nuclear war. So every now and then I do like to give nuclear war uh, its due here in the collapse of everything because it could be the big kahuna. And uh, so for today's or now, well, tonight's, and I probably won't even publish this till Wednesday, tonight's straight up doomer porn we're going to put the little dog to bed here. Yes. And uh, put the little dog to bed. And have some straight up doomer porn about a nuclear war uh, coming at you. So... This is some, uh, well, now, Lord, with that camera, can you hear the heater going? Let's, uh, see if I don't freeze to death without the, without the heater. Uh, this is some Doomer chick, uh, on Medium named Amanda Claypool, I vaguely remember covering something else that Amanda wrote. But anyway, today, <clears throat> Amanda is going to be coming, uh, is going to be bringing us a book review by another uh, Doomer chick you may have heard of named Annie Jacobson. And her new book, Nuclear War, A Scenario, and... Amanda's takeaway from Annie Jacobson's book is nuclear war will be far worse than you think. I'm trying to imagine how nuclear war could be far worse than I think. Uh, I don't exactly think that nuclear war is in, like in the same league with corona panic by the way, but anyway, this is a long, involved story. I'm not going to read every word of it, but let's just move on down to where she finally gets to business. <clears throat> In her latest book, Nuclear War, A Scenario, Annie Jacobson provides a minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of what would happen should we find ourselves in a nuclear war? The picture she paints is beyond bleak. Those who survive will envy those who do not. This article will look at some of the key takeaways from the book. It will put into perspective what a nuclear war means for humanity and more importantly, you know, more importantly than humanity, 
what it means for you as an individual, if anything is certain, it is that worrying about a nuclear war is as futile as surviving the war itself. Okay, and so she breaks this down, I believe, into five takeaways. Takeaway number one, there will not be enough time to react to a nuclear war. Uh, so anyway, guys, I, I'm just, this is a long, involved story, and I want to center on some of the later takeaways. Uh, but So what Annie Jacobson does is the scenario, I'm not sure why she does this, is she looks at if North Korea were to fire a nuclear missile toward Washington, D.C., uh, with the Pentagon in particular, and it would take 24 minutes for a, a missile uh, that the North Koreans have in their arsenal right now to uh, send from North Korea to D.C. So all of these different, uh, uh, you know, military installations along the way, uh, you know, from coast to coast would have 24 minutes. All these people, is this threat real and do we counter it? Uh, <clears throat> so let me just pick up there. At first glance, you might be awestruck by the thought that has gone into defending America from nuclear attacks. But when you think about it, the complexity of it inhibits quick decision making. Each installation is staffed with analysts who are trained to react to a nuclear attack. This is a big deal that should not be taken lightly. It means one of two things. Every single person responding to a nuclear attack will want to triple check to make sure that they are, that what they are seeing is true before launching a counterattack, <clears throat> or they will have become little more than Pavlovian dogs reading and willing to retaliate on command. The latter reaction will make nuclear war an inevitability, while the former could slow down a response. If a missile launch on the Pentagon is real, 24 minutes is not enough time to react. You could not make a decision about key events in your life in that amount of time. How could it possibly be enough to initiate a nuclear war? The result there will not be enough time to issue any warnings. Government leaders will be forced to make important decisions about launching nuclear we weapons while fleeing Washington. Their judgment will likely be clouded. If the most powerful people in our country will not have enough time to react, what does that say about you and I. <clears throat> so that's takeaway number one. Uh, you will have no warning. Uh, I mean, if you have a warning about an incoming nuclear bomb, uh, you might just have enough time to bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. So takeaway number two. <clears throat> Escalation is inevitable. With such little time to react to a nuclear attack, it is unlikely that whatever plans are in place will actually be followed. In instincts bending towards self-preservation and survival 
will take over. Um, despite the best planning, it's more likely than not that a power vacuum will emerge if the attack does not affect America's leadership, the shock of it surely will. The absence, you know, in all of these uh, government leaders, you know, and I'm trying to think of either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump uh, being uh, in the middle of a nuclear attack, uh, do you really think your government leaders are going to be concerned about you and your little kids? Um, the absence of a clear leader will lead to a breakdown in communications across the pond, specifically with Russia. Jacobson imagines a scenario where the Russian leadership is miffed, miffed by the U.S. Uh, miffed by the U.S. president refuses to speak to him, not knowing if he's dying somewhere between Washington and Raven Rock in Pennsylvania. I don't have time to explain to you what Raven Rock in Pennsylvania is, but it is a good story. Uh, <clears throat> without an open line of communication, there will be no pathway to de-escalation. As Jacobson notes, missiles are there on their way to North Korea. You know, if we counterattack, missiles flying from here to North Korea, Korea will have to fly over Russian airspace. Assuming the worst, Moscow will inevitably react. A long history of nuclear entanglements with Russia and America's strong alliance with Europe means whatever happens will escalate into a global conflict in a matter of minutes, a single nuclear attack will not be an isolated incident. A scenario where there's a breakdown in the chain of command breaks and a void in American leadership will move the world beyond brinkmanship. World War III will break out and there will be little anyone can do to stop it. Okay, so the takeaways ramp up. Takeaway number three, no shit Sherlock, there will not be anything to govern afterwards. One of the most interesting points made in the book is the amount of planning that goes into the anticipating of a nuclear attack. The military has a plan. The civilian government has a plan. FEMA has a plan. Everyone has a plan. But plans won't matter when there is nothing left to govern after a nuclear war breaks out. There won't be people in place to carry out all those plans. But while you may think that the plans that are in place are designed to save you and your family, you're in for a rude awakening. Whatever plans do exist, exist for one purpose and one purpose only to preserve the government. There is very little in place to prepare the general public, much less to warn us in time. Do you think there is a post-attack plan to make sure you have everything you need to ensure your survival? 
Absolutely not. Just look at the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina to realize that. The plans that exist are intended to keep the government going, but that will not matter when there is not a population left to govern. The absence of any realistic civilian plans means should you and I miraculously survive the initial attack, we will likely be left to fend for ourselves whatever resources remain, energy, food, and shelter, will be directed to preserving the continuity of government, not your life. This paints a rather bleak picture of the state of things for the average person. There won't be enough time for anyone to react, much less preempt escalation. It is inevitable that whatever lies on the other side of a nuclear attack will be fraught with peril and suffering as those who remain fight with one another to survive. <clears throat> okay, take away number four. There won't be just one bomb. <clears throat> when a nuclear attack happens, it won't be just one single bomb. There will be several. The world's nuclear powers will unleash their arsenals onto population centers within a matter of minutes. A nuclear war is not about one or two bombs hitting a couple of select targets. There will be thousands of nuclear bombs raining down all at once. According to the Arms Control Association, whoever that is, the world's nuclear powers have a collective arsenal of 12,512 nuclear weapons. <clears throat> the purpose of maintaining these weapons is to maintain a state of deterrence so long as no one launches a nuclear weapon deterrence holds. But what happens when deterrence fails as Jacobson demonstrates in her scenario? When that happens, stockpiling nuclear weapons will no longer have any value. The only value they will then have is by being deployed. So that is what is going to happen. The nine countries that have nuclear weapons will likely deploy them. <clears throat> the first three takeaways suddenly get much worse when you realize a single nuclear attack will lead to the deployment of thousands of nuclear weapons all at once. It's not just about the United States, or North Korea, or even Russia for that matter. If a nuclear war breaks out, it will be total annihilation for everyone on the planet, regardless of whether or not you're a combatant. One way or another, everyone on the planet will be affected. Uh, well, I guess there, I thought there were five, but I guess it keeps going. Uh, okay, number five, there are curveballs you're not thinking about. The biggest surprise from the book wasn't the sheer scale of a nuclear uh, attack. Rather, it was all of the unknown variables, you know, is what Donald Rumsfeld sounding just like Don Juan Matus. It is the unknown unknowns 
that are going to bite us in the ass. Uh, the most intelligent thing that Donald Rumsfeld ever, ever said in his life is the unknown unknowns. It's the curveballs uh, coming out of left field. It's the black swan events. Uh, anyway, uh, so one of these, and this is a nod to Andy the Gardener, this, this, this is just one of the, the many possible curveballs coming in in addition uh, that could be coming our way is an EMP. I don't know why they just don't do the EMP without the nuclear. Why do you need all these nuclear bombs when you can just do an EMP for so much easier? An EMP or electromagnetic pulse attack pulse puts out an intense surge of electricity and magnetism in an area. All electronics would be fried. This includes vehicles and cell towers. You would have no way to flee and no way to call for help. Yeah, but that's not the only problem. An EMP attack that comes with within a nuclear attack would throw America back into the Stone Age. Not only would we lose the ability to maintain modern conveniences like smartphones and air conditioning, but we would lose the ability to pump oil or treat water in an instant. Everything we need to survive would disappear. This is why it's such a big... Uh, this is why it's Andy the Gardener's favorite fantasy. And while preppers may have cultivated some skills to help them survive this kind of situation, even they will be caught off guard. If the initial attack does not kill you or the fallout, you know, the nuclear fallout in the aftermath, starvation or thirst surely will. Okay. Takeaway number six. Survival is futile. Nuclear war is considered a mass extinction event on par with the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs millions of years ago. While nuclear war will be a man-made catalyst for extinction, it will lead to extinction nonetheless. <clears throat> Sit and ponder that for a moment. We are the closest we have ever been to an event that would not just destroy the United States, the global world order, or even Western civilization for that matter. We are the closest we have ever been to a mass extinction event that would lead to Homo sapiens being wiped off the face of the earth. A total loss of our species. Of course, you notice uh, they never uh, mention our fellow earthlings. They never mention anywhere in this story. As far as I know, our fellow earthlings are never mentioned anywhere in the book. It's all about humans. While Jacobson's scenario is not likely, it is still possible, and that is the truly terrifying part. By the end of the book, you realize surviving might actually be a worse outcome than death itself. Okay, takeaway number seven, everyone loses everyone. There are no win winners 
in a nuclear war. That is the biggest takeaway. With nothing to govern, politicians lose. With no economy to capitalize on, businessmen lose. And with no food or water to subsist on, humans lose. No one wins should a nuclear war break out. No one. And that's what makes the proposition of a nuclear war so horrifying in the first place. We all lose. Period. There you go. Uh, and then she goes on. Uh, uh, she talks briefly, and, and, and this is what uh, you know. I'm thinking uh, about all uh, these deep fakes and scammers and hackers and AI and all of this shit. With the rise of deep fakes and misinformation, it is now possible to create the conditions for a nuclear war to unfold before a single missile is launched. How does anyone discern truth from fiction anymore? But the most important takeaway from the book arguably has nothing to do with nuclear war at all. Whatever happens in such a scenario is going to happen. There is nothing you or I can do to stop it, and there is very little we can do to survive it. If you do survive, you will probably wish you had not the survival of the human race of the human race will rest on your shoulders and i don't think that is a burden anyone wants to be tasked with yes what the book shows is how important it is to appreciate the abundance of life as it currently exists, even though we all have our personal challenges and things may seem bleak. Yes, compared what would happen in the middle of a nuclear attack, things are actually pretty good right now. We would be wise to appreciate that after all, we're only 90 seconds away, you know, according to the doomsday clock. We are only 90 seconds away from losing everything. Yes. Appreciate what you have right now in this moment. It could be gone in an instant. And I'm going to appreciate this heater blowing on me in the middle of August. Anyway, I think that's a long way of saying getting out there and enjoying it while you still can. So I'm going to appreciate my little dog. My little dog while I still can. What do you think, little dog? What do you think about nuclear annihilation? You say, Pop, I'm just thinking about chippy annihilation. Dreaming of chippy annihilation. Bye, guys.